So my name is Malia. I'm an R1 staff nurse and also our thoracic unit based unit based educator <laughs> for R1 and CTICU. Um, we know chest tubes are becoming more common on other units, so I figured I'd come up and talk with you. Um, what you guys have in your hands are a bunch of different chest tubes. So if I can say this one because it's the weirdest one. This is called a trocar, and so it comes with a pointy end, and this is to assist with an insertion. So just like an IV, the physician makes a little slit, they slide this through the ribs, and then once they're into the pleural space, they simply advance the tube up and pull the lead out, okay? Depending on what you're draining will determine what type and size of chest tube you want. So there are larger outlets, smaller outlets, um, bent ones, so this could be a diaphragmatic tube. Okay, so it goes, lies right along the diaphragm. That's all it goes around. So objectives, we're gonna review the anatomy, identify reasons, so why do people get chest tubes, um, be able to distinguish the different sections of our portable chest tube systems, determine the presence of an air leak, and then identify steps when there's an accidental dislodgement or an accidental removal, which is what we're all really afraid of. So it's important to know your lung anatomy, right? Your left lung has two lobes. It's narrower, longer, smaller to accommodate your heart. Um, on the right, it has three lobes. And then in between those are the fissures. And those are the grooves in the lung that divide it into different lobes. And that's important if you read maybe that your patient has had a right upper lobectomy in their past medical history. It means from that lower fissure there above all of that has been removed. We can remove one lobe, two lobe, we can do wedge resections where we go in and just cut out a piece, and we can actually remove the entire lung, which is called a pneumonectomy. So the pleura and the pleural space. So the continuous membrane covers the chest wall and diaphragm, as well as the surface of the lung. So you've got your parietal on the underside of your rib cage, and then your visceral, which is over the lung. And then the pleural space is between is filled with this serous lubricating fluid. So it's this yellow fluid, everybody has it. It's between 50 and 100 mLs at a time for you and I and a normal person. And it allows your membranes to adhere to one another while sliding smoothly. So if you think about, back to like microbiology, when you were making slides, you take a slide, you put a glass of, or a drop of water on top of your slide and you stick another slide on top of it. They slide against each other really easily, but it's really difficult to pull them apart. It's the same process with your lungs. So you need a chest tube when something happens in the pleural space to disrupt that adhesion. So. Reasons for that, surgery, traumatic chest injuries, so car accidents with a pneumothorax, a hemothorax, or a tension pneumothorax, which is the one that you know you see in ER where they're like, he's got a tension pneumo, and so comes running with a needle and sticks it in their chest. Uh -huh. <gasps> oh, feels so much better. Doesn't actually happen quite. Uh, pleural effusion, which is just a buildup of fluid between the pleura, and infection, so when there's pus in that pleural space, or treatment with a sclerosing agent. So um, chemotherapy, doxycycline, all sorts of stuff. So chest tubes allow air and fluid to leave the thoracic cavity. It's a one-way valve um, to prevent that from returning back into the chest, and it can also be set up to create pull in the form of negative pressure to help evacuate the space. So if we, will it go backwards? No, it won't. They will. Um, <clears throat> so in olden days, and it's important to sort of know what olden days actually was because it'll help you figure it out. We've started off with a one bottle, one way valve. So this allowed air out, but not in. There's no pull. It's not intended for drainage. Um, and the valve is in the water. So we used these glass valves, these glass vials, and they were actually much larger. Filled it up to two centimeters, put the tube under two centimeters of water that allowed the air to bubble out and created a water seal so that nothing could get back into the chest. Okay. So what happens if we pull that tube out of the water? Yep, air goes back into the chest, you get a repeat pneumothorax. So then you got people who need to also have drainage. So we came up with a two bottle system. So it allows your air out but not in. You get a rise and fall of fluid with breathing. It's called titling. It creates no pull, but it does allow you to collect drainage. So hemothorax. Um, malignant pleural effusions, CHF patients who have um, pleural fluid. So, 
first bottle collects drainage, air travels through to second bottle where tube is underneath two centimeters of water to create the water seal. Three bottles is your valve, your drainage, and your pull, so it allows your air out. Titling can be minimal or absent, so that rise and fall, and it allows for collection, but also you can suck on that. So the drainage gets collected in your first chamber, the air goes over to the water seal, it continues to be sucked out, and the depth of the water in your third chamber is what determines the amount of suction getting to your patient. So, how easy would it be to walk a patient who has three glass <laughs> bottles <laughs> attached to them? So somebody really, really smart and hopefully made a lot of money created these commercial chest tubes. So these are the two most common ones that you'll see here at Main Med. Um, both are made by Teleflex. They're the Pluravac Wet and the Pluravac Plus, which we also call the Dry Suction. Have you guys seen both of those or just one? I've only seen the Wet. Yeah, okay, do. just the Wet. That is the most common one that you guys will see. Occasionally, you will see the other one if we run out of the Pluravax. <laughs> so. But all of them are still based on that three bottle system. So that first bottle is for your drainage. The second bottle is for your water seal. And the third bottle is for your suction. They make it really easy. So your first bottle is white, drainage. Second bottle is red, water seal. Third bottle is blue for suction. So white, red, and blue. Drainage, water seal, suction, white, red, and blue, drainage, water seal, suction. Okay? What you guys want to remember is your water seal is your window into your thoracic cavity. So that's where you're going to see all of the changing in negative pressure. <clears throat> so the disadvantages um, of this lovely Pluravac Plus is a knockover can spill your collection um, and the contents then, and you need to change out the system. That's most important if you tip this over and drainage gets over into your water seal chamber. If you tip this over and this fluid just comes down into your second column, you can pretty much continue going on unless there's some question that some of the fluid has moved its way all the way over or the suction's up. And then also gradual evaporation from the wet suction chamber. So when this is bubbling, it'll evaporate. <clears throat> Advantages, you only need a little bit of wall suction, and there's an audible sound, so you can walk by your patient's room and still know that they're on suction. Dry suction, wet water seal. So at MMC, these are used for all of our open heart surgery patients. Uh, it's silent, and so it's a digital. So you have to look for the orange float here, and the dial on the side is what determines how much suction you're going to be giving to the patient. So this is to minus 20, minus 30, and minus 40. The reason we use these for open heart surgery patients is this is an auto transfusion port. So in our open heart surgery patients, if they put out more than 800 mLs um, in two hours, we can take this, give it to perfusion, they pull the blood out, spin it, and give it back to the patient. Please don't ever hook suction up to this. Um, that gets tipped over, it's totally okay, and occasionally you will see this with trauma patients, so somebody who has a really big air leak that maybe the minus 20 of suction just isn't enough for, they'll ask for a higher amount of suction and you would want to go to the Pluravac Plus. <coughs> the Mini 500 is also a great new invention, so patients who have air leaks, it used to be that you were in the hospital until your air leak resolved, we created this little ambulatory chest tube system. It hangs on a belt. It's a dry suction, dry water seal. So we use it with patients who have persistent, small to moderate, stable air leaks so that they can go home and heal in their own home. So they sleep in their own bed, they eat their own food. Um, and we also use it for patients who have malignant pleural effusions with high chest tube output who don't tolerate intermittent thoracentesis. So intermittent drainage, they need to have the continuous drainage because it's pretty great because they can just disconnect this pour the contents into the toilet, reconnect it, and undo their slide. So, this is a great invention. We've really decreased our length of stay for patients. We do still have one-way valves. Um, so the Heimlich valve, uh, you may occasionally see. And the Pneumasat is a new product, actually, that we're bringing into the hospital shortly. It only allows for about 30 mLs of collection. These are just like a balloon. So right, they allow the air out, but don't allow any air back in. 
<clears throat> and then Blake drains. I passed around a Blake drain. Thank you. So more and more commonly, especially post-surgical, we're seeing Blake drains to be used as thoracic chest drains. The important thing to recognize about this, there's actually four channels instead of holes. And there's a black dot down at the bottom that indicates where those channels end. It needs to remain, a lot of times we'll, this can go either to a pleurovac or to a bulb, depending on what they're using it for. And you always, of course, want to ensure that your bulb holds suction. Okay? If it doesn't, then you have to start troubleshooting it. But if that black ball is out, that's an indication it's gotten dislodged. You guys can see this is much softer, mm -hmm. right? It's better tolerated by patients. It does come in different diameters. So always, always really important. Um, when taking care of a patient with a chest tube, you need to think about why your patient has that chest tube. And then there are some key assessments of the patient. So always be thinking about, is it because of air or is it because of fluid that your patient needs to have the chest tube? The order sets can be a little bit um, <coughs> strange, especially if they're not used to looking at them. So it determines your suction type, your suction amount or setting, which would be determined in which one of these sections. What color would you like? The suction? Yep, blue, suction. Blue. Blue, blue. blue. right. Um, and then your dressing, your drainage, and then further instructions, such as do not disconnect or disconnect from suction. So the top one is what your water seal order will look like, and the bottom one is what a wall suction will look like. There are patients who should not come off of suction. <clears throat> so always when you're assessing your patient with a chest tube, you want to go all the way from the patient to the wall. So your respiratory assessment, you guys know how to do a respiratory assessment, right? So breath sounds, work of breathing, SpO2. Adventitious breath sounds are really common with chest tubes. So you might get a pleural rub, right? As the lung expands from a pneumothorax, you're gonna have a lot of atelectasis, so they'll sound like fine crackles or coarse crackles at the sort of end of inspiration as things are starting to expand. You might have more wrong time. Your insertion site, so always checking your dressing, changing it at least daily and PRN. Patients who have a big pleural effusion sometimes will leak out of the side. Um, and so you just want to be conscientious of having wet dressing against the skin for a long time. Um, mark it for crepitus. Have any of you guys ever seen crepitus, subcutaneous emphysema? So we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then assess the site for tube migration, so making sure that that black dot hasn't been pulled out or any of your outlets aren't out either. Tubing, make sure that it's patent, all of your connections are tight, avoid kinks or dependent loops, and note the color and consistency of the drainage in the tubing. And that's important because sometimes as things resolve um, or new things develop, your drainage all drainage ends up in this column first, and then it's overflow that ends up in further columns out. Mm. So it's important that your drainage in the tube is the most recent drainage from your patient. Okay. Um, and then observe for titling. <clears throat> Next, you're gonna check your water seal chamber, making sure that it's filled to that correct level, and that correct level is two centimeters. So somebody a long time ago decided sticking a tube into two centimeters of water was the correct depth. It's worked, we've stuck with it, and there we go. And that is in which section of our chest tube? Yep, the red one. So that's gonna be right down here. Um, and so when you assess for an air leak, you wanna have your patient take normal breaths, okay? and you're gonna get this titling. So as the patient breathes in and as the patient breathes out, the tubing will go up and down. You then have them take a cough and usually they go like this. <coughs> it's not a very good cough, so you actually have to make them cough. And then the third thing to do is to have them blow on their thumb like they're blowing on a trumpet. And you might see an air leak. So that's what an air leak looks like. You can have a continuous air leak, which I can't even quite do with this, or intermittent air leaks. 
a new or an increased air leak is important to recognize because more patients are being out there on water seal. So if you go in and do your morning assessment with your patient and they have an air leak just when they do Valsalva, and then you go in and you're doing your med pass, your noon med pass, and you're, they're talking to them and they're going that's a new increased air leak. Okay. So you would want to do your full respiratory to make sure that they're tolerating it. Um, and then notify your provider. Titling is a normal finding in your chest tube, so is when the water advances up this water seal chamber. So again, your water seal chamber is your window into the thorax, so it's telling you what's happening actually in your chest cavity. They're a little bit lazy, so down here is actually positive and all the way up is negative. Your lungs have to be at negative pressure inside your thoracic cavity in order for them to fully expand. So physiologic norm is about minus six to minus 13 inside the chest cavity. So you'll see this increase and decrease. So as the diaphragm draws down to inhale, it increases negative pressure, bringing your air in. As the diaphragm relaxes, it allows your lungs to expire the, the air. Um, there's a black button up here. It's a positive pressure relief valve or negative pressure relief valve. Um, sometimes you'll see this come all the way up and then set, tend to stay there, okay? Especially when you take a patient just off suction. This right here is a negative pressure relief valve and what it does is it introduces positive pressure into the system. So if your patient is off suction, please do not press this button as you can actually cause a pneumothorax for your patient. Mm. So you're letting air into the system before your water seal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So how much drainage should you expect? Again, it's important to know, are you dealing with air or are you dealing with fluid? How much is too much? It should always be a decreasing amount of drainage from the time that your procedure happens. So after your first two hours after surgery, it really shouldn't exceed 100 mLs an hour. Okay, and for some surgeries though, the first 24 hours post-operative, it may be as much as 500 to 1,000 mLs. To think about a patient who had a rockin' empyema in there, we have to evacuate all of that. Um, or somebody who might have had a malignant pleural effusion. A simple pneumo, so your guy who gets in an MVA, fractures a rib, doesn't have a hemothorax, but needs a chest tube, you're gonna have very little to no drainage because what you're getting out is just air, right? So red alert situations, so these are situations you really want to take note of. If your patient dumps more than 200 mLs at a time, so if every time you stand your patient up, they suddenly put out a big old gush of fluid, one, you want to sort of think, okay, have they been lying in bed all night and this has just been accumulating there, or is this happening all the time? Um, dark red blood that's continuously being put out without signs of slowing down, so your patient has a venous bleed. Obviously, bright red blood that's coming out is an arterial bleed. Milky pink or white output. <clears throat> um, don't wait until it's high output. So milky pink or white output is indicative of what's called a chyle leak. So sometimes you can actually nick the lymphatic system. And so when your patient starts to take in a diet that has saturated fat in it, your lymphatic system will start to drain and you'll get this milky pink drainage that's high in output, so between 500 and 1,000 mLs in 24 hours. And then if you're putting out more than or equal to 100 mLs an hour for two hours. So notifying your provider, increasing your monitoring, checking output one to two hours. So your water seal, right, we talked about it, two centimeters, checking for an air leak. So you can have intermittent continuous, and you look for it where? Which section? For the air leak. Okay. In the red. In the yeah. red, right. Um, and then your air leak should resolve as your lung re-expands. Um, this is what it looks like when you actually have an air leak. Um, air leaks are more common in patients with emphysema, COPD, chronic steroid use, so you have to think about the lungs as lace, right, with those little alveoli, especially when we go in there and then we try to flip off those little blebs. So air leak patients are more frequently on water seal with active air leaks. So a patient who's not tolerating their air leak might have increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, 
DOE, um, decreased SPO sound, SPO2 breath sounds, and increasing apprehension or anxiety. What to do, so of course, always make sure your patient's safe. Check your tubing, because a lot of times, especially with your pneumothorax patients, they've gotten repositioned in bed and their chest tube tubing has gotten kinked off, and then their lung has dropped again. Um, if your patient's just come off suction, you might need to reattach it, and so, quick piece about suction. So on these ones, your suction is here, okay? And then this is your suction tubing that runs to the wall. Um, so the wall suction creates a vacuum, and the column of water is what actually creates the pull. So depending on how deep your water is, that's how much suction actually gets to your patient. So it's like trying to get the chocolate down at the bottom of a really big glass of chocolate milk. Right? If there's only a little bit of milk left in there, it's way easier to do than if it's a huge glass. Um, so increasing the column of water will increase the pull. Increasing the dial on the wall doesn't change anything except for how loud this is next to your patient. So I walk into rooms sometimes and it's like, because it's boiling so hard, it doesn't need to be doing that. You just need a gentle simmer. So bubbles continuously sort of go. Um, how many of you guys tape your chest tubes down to the floor? So I'm going to advocate for not, not doing that. that. I know we do that yeah, because we don't want to have to tip them over, right? Tips happen. Mm -hmm. um, I actually talked with a patient about it. She had transferred from another floor in the hospital, and as I was getting her into bed, um, She's like, you're not going to tape my chest tube down? And I said, no, I'm not. She goes, oh, good. It felt like they were tethering me to the bed. <laughs> and so we created these for them to be mobile with. And then we go and tape them to the bed, and they're like, oh, I am not mobile anymore. I'm stuck to this little radius. So still understand if you want to do it, just be conscientious about what you're doing. Um, so again, keeping it for continuous bubbling, you do need to check it briefly, so just by kinking off your suction here, because this water will evaporate, okay? So filling and replacing water. How many of you guys know how to do that? There you go. It's like a little funnel thing. Yeah, so usually there's a funnel. Obviously that funnel disappears a lot, so you can always use a 60 ml syringe. Um, and you just pop the end out of the back of your syringe. Um, so this one is overfilled, okay, so I got a little aggressive. What I can actually do is clean the hub here, put in a blunt needle and pull that fluid back so it comes back down to minus 20. You can do the same thing if you overfill into your 20 there. And then you undo your plug here, put your filter in, pour in your fluid, until you get to the line that you need. Now, the, the tip of the day is when you're filling that 20 centimeters one, and obviously, please call us to change over chest tubes, okay? We don't want you guys doing that on your own. Um, but one of the tips is you actually put the funnel 